Our readings this morning are, surprise, surprise, one from Romans, and then a verse from the letter to the Hebrews. First from Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is, a, is kind of an insert, if you will, in Paul's argument about the necessity for faith. But it's a critical insert because he uses for a broad scope of, of readers an Old Testament reference, namely Abraham, who exemplifies that faith about which he is talking. So I read now from Romans chapter 4, first from 13, and then we go to the end of the chapter. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. And now, a letter to the Hebrews. This 11th chapter is a, a song, if you will, of faith, of the faith of believers from way back. And in the midst of it comes this verse. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And this is the word of the Lord. In the 1890s, a French tightrope walker, Charles Blondin, and my apologies to any of you who really speak French, Charles Blondin gained considerable international fame, nowhere more so than in North America. His greatest feat here? He walked across a rope over Niagara Falls, first alone and then pushing the wheelbarrow. Finally, upon his reaching the other side, the crowd's applause was louder than the falls. Blondin then stopped and asked, do you believe that I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? Yes, yes, yes. You are the greatest tightrope walker in the world. You can do anything. The crowd responded. Blondin replied, all right. Someone get into the wheelbarrow. <laughs> no one did. Did they really believe Blondin? They'd seen the physical evidence. Together, they'd affirmed their confidence. But did they truly believe him? Clearly, the crowd effect was present that day at Niagara Falls. Everyone around was shouting, yes, we believe. Denial would have been very unpopular, socially unacceptable. But full acceptance of Blondin's offer would have been very risky. They ultimately would have been putting their lives into his hands. What does it mean to believe? The Oxford Dictionary gives four basic meanings. Accept as true. Think or suppose. And when it's used within, as in believe in, have faith, confidence, trust. And finally, the religious sense, have faith. I'll be using faith almost interchangeably with belief today, since we obviously have a religious context. These 
definitions essentially have both intellectual, that is, truth, think, and emotional, confidence, trust, faith elements. The two, intellectual and emotional, are not separate. Dr. James Sire, author of Habits of the Mind, notes that, quote, thinking is rarely a matter of cold, heartless, calculating logic. Thinking feels. There is indeed a unity between thinking and feeling. He goes on to urge, let your thoughts be felt. Let your feelings be thought. As we turn to these first words of the creed, I believe, I am suggesting that we are drawing on both the emotional and intellectual meanings of the word believe. As we will be going through the various elements of the creed over these next weeks, we are positing acceptance of each element, affirming it to be true. Our Presbyterian Church is a creedal church, that is, it has creeds. We are not simply a warm and fuzzy group of caring people, although with or without fuzz, we are and should be deeply caring. From the introduction to our Book of Confessions comes the following, quote, All Christians are, by definition, people who confess their faith, people who make their own the earliest Christian confession, Jesus Christ is Lord. The Christian Church lives only through the continual renewal of this fundamental confession of faith that all Christians and Christian bodies make together. On the other hand, a confession of faith is an officially adopted statement that spells out a church's understanding of the one basic confession of the Lordship of Christ. Such statements have not always been called confessions, they have also been called creeds, statements of belief, or other similar names. Our old Book of Order, which for the most part has been condensed, not supplanted by the new, states, quote, the creeds and confessions of this church reflect a particular stance within the history of God's people. They are the result of prayer, thought, and experience within a living tradition. They serve to strengthen personal commitment and the life and witness of the community of believers. End of that quote. Our creeds do not restrict, they magnify the expressed faith of the church. And we do not make adherence to them requirements for any but the former ordained leadership of the church. All are welcome here to inquire into the faith, to worship God from even a limited perspective of the divine. But I would strongly suggest that the Apostles' Creed in particular, outlining as it does the basic tenets of our biblical faith, enriches, gives meaning to our personal faith. Some weeks ago I spoke of content-starved Christians who were able to consume only milk Friends, it's time to go on a high-calorie diet. We'll never grow up without it. So beyond what I have to say, why is believing or faith important? Well, first of all, our ultimate authority, Jesus, says so. In Luke 20, I'm sorry, Luke 10, verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Writing in Christianity Today, Justin Holcomb, an Episcopal priest from Central Florida, and professor of theology at both Gordon-Conwell and Reformed Theological Seminaries, says, It certainly is true that loving God and others is at the heart of the gospel. But Jesus calls us to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Loving God involves thinking rightly about him, just as loving a friend or significant other 
involves rightly knowing their interests, beliefs, habits, and history. In order to love God right and to be assured of the salvation he offers, we must know who God is and what he has done for us in and through Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis has long been helpful to me in sorting out critical tenets of the faith. He is particularly helpful when it comes to the oft-heard discussion of what is a Christian? Many, and I suspect some of you here would join in, feel we have no right to judge who can, said to be, who can be said to be a Christian. To an extent, I would agree. For ultimate judgment rests with God alone, and only God knows our hearts. But, and here I turn to Lewis's argument, after noting the objection, may not many a man who cannot believe these doctrines be far more truly Christian than some who do? Lewis says, this objection is in one sense very right, very charitable, very spiritual, very sensitive. It has every amiable quality except that of being useful. He then illustrates by giving the history of the word gentleman. Originally, it meant one who had a coat of arms and some landed property. To say that a man was not a gentleman was not an insult. It was an observation of circumstances. Similarly, says Lewis, substituting Christian for meaning good, kind, helpful, even loving, spoils the word Christian for any useful purpose. So, he affirms, we must therefore stick to the original obvious meaning. The name Christian was give, first given at Antioch, and we read about this in the 11th chapter of Acts, to the disciples, to those who accepted the teaching of the apostles. Belief is important to the definition of the appellation Christian. As a preface to its question, what then must a Christian believe, the Heidelberg Catechism, in a preceding question, asks, what is true faith? The Catechism's response? It is not only a certain knowledge by which I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me through the gospel that not only to others, but to me also, God has given the forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness and salvation, out of sheer grace, solely for the sake of Christ's saving work. Now, did you, in the midst of that 16th century translated from the German language, catch from knowledge and trust the idea that lay in the blown down experience? If you believe, that is no. Get in, trust the wheelbarrow. All right, so what keeps us from such belief? I would suggest four blocks, though I think there are as many as the enemy can come up with. They are one, intellectual. Two, volitional, that is having to do with the will. Three, societal. And four, observational. First, the intellectual. For the unchurched, which makes up most of our society today, the very idea of an intangible deity who is somehow involved in the affairs of men is extraordinarily difficult to grasp. I have said before and say again, our language and our practices are foreign to many. We can be helped by the very concept that this intangible deity became human in the historical person of Jesus Christ. But even this notion is hard for many to wrap their minds around. We have a very special mission field, I believe, among this population. But that discussion is for another occasion. But there is also, 
Within the church itself, however, a segment which has its own intellectual problems. In Saving Jesus from the Church, Pastor Robin Myers cites an ancient pagan philosopher, Celsus, who says of Christianity, taking its root in the lower classes, the religion continues to spread among the vulgar. Nay, one can even say it spreads because of its vulgarity and the illiteracy of its adherents. And while there are a few modern, reasonable, and intelligent people who are inclined to interpret its beliefs allegorically, yet it thrives in its pure form among the ignorant. Such strong language probably would be rare today. But later in the book, Myers says of Easter, the celebration of the resurrection, that would-be followers of Jesus have been failed by the church. Before they can sing the hallelujah chorus, they must check their brains at the door. Myers continues, why not say it as plainly as the renowned biblical scholar John Dominic Cross? Quote, I do not think that anyone, anywhere, at any time brings dead people back to life. If a pastor and a renowned biblical scholar have difficulties with believing some of the central tenets of our faith, is it any wonder that thinking church members have problems? To be fair to Myers, however, he says elsewhere, the ultimate defining characteristic of Christianity is the incarnation, the mystery of God's presence in a person. When Christianity is personal, is, it is at its best. The Word became flesh, as John puts it, and lived among us, the incarnation. I'm convinced, however, that frequently Intellectual objections to the gospel can be a cover, conscious or deliberate, or not, can be a cover for fear of its implications. Truly believing Jesus Christ is Lord means letting go our final control. A number of very good friends in my life have quite honestly said some version of, I want to run my own life or Walt Whitman's I am the captain of my soul. We just don't want to cede control. Although, after being on this earth enough years, some of us are forced to admit we really don't have all that much control. And volitional ceding is what belief is about. We have to get in the wheelbarrow. Our current society and its condition discourages confidence in a God who could allow so much evil to exist. Particularly the unbeliever finds little of comfort in any words of faith. I'm quite prepared to admit that theology does little for me as I consider the day's headlines. Where I turn for my confidence is to the person with whom I've had an ongoing relationship. Jesus. From a hymn we sang when I was a young undergraduate, I take thy promise, Lord. Into life's future fearless I may gaze. For Jesus, thou art with me all the days. So shall the darkest hour with glory shine. Then when these earthly years have passed away, let me be with thee in the perfect day. The fourth, the observational block to belief, is one over which we do have control. Many the time have I heard it said, and you may as well, if that person or those people are representative of Christianity, I want no part of it. Do you know what they mean? Our patience irritability, even anger, never mind ethical lapses. Are we the block to inquire into the faith? Or have we stood in the way of growth among our fellow believers? 
Paul, writing to both the Romans and the Corinthians, issues strong warnings to members of the church in relation to other members. Don't be a stumbling block. Now, having suggested what believe means, and why it's important to believe, then noting briefly some of the barriers to that belief, we come to the I in the phrase. While it is clearly true what Karl Barth says of the creed, the act of the credo is the act of confession. The subject of the confession is the church, and the individual only in virtue of his bearing the mark of membership in the church. Nevertheless, what we say in our liturgy, our confession of faith is, I believe. So by virtue of this, we are making the confession personal. This is where the rubber hits the road. I am aware that some of you recite the creed reluctantly or hesitate in certain phrases. At least one person I've known refuses out of what she regards as honesty to say the creed at all. So let me suggest in closing that there is an order, a sequence to belief. Some of you, though not all by any means, believe that when I tell you something it's true. It's because you know me. Over time, you've learned you can trust me. While we'll talk further about it in later messages, it is when we have become more and more acquainted with Jesus Christ that we learn that we can trust him and what he has to teach us. And the longer, the more intimate that relationship, the deeper the confidence we have. Let us together then explore Jesus in order to truly believe. Let's get into the wheelbarrow with confidence in the one whose loving hands will surely steer us over the falls of an uncertain life.